I thought we'd start with looking at an intact lakeshore shoreland system. What do we see there? What kind of attributes and characteristics will we see in, in a healthy, robust, intact lakeshore? We started looking out in the water, and what do we see? First thing I see out in that water is a tree stump, a little cluster of root wads that's been broken down over time. And the ecosystem services that come with that root wad, we get food and cover for critters, right? Erosion control, believe it or not, as that ice push comes or that wave action hits that wood, it's going to dissipate that energy. Moving towards shore, we start to get maybe some floating leaf, water lilies or water shields going on. And then right near shore, maybe a foot of water, we see emergent plants. Maybe there's some pickerel weed or some uh, bulrush beds. Well, now we've crawled up near shore. We've looked at our aquatic plants, and what do I see right here next to shore? But some fallen logs, trees that just have fallen into the water over time. And those logs position themselves along the water. They might be 20, 40-foot-sized trees. And they're providing the same kind of habitat, food and cover, erosion control from that wave action, and ice push. Next, I want us to literally look at that land-water interface where the land and water meet. And what do I see? Three layers of vegetation. This is probably where the change has been most on our shorelines. Starting down on the ground, I have wildflowers, sedges, rushes, even ferns growing. Then I have a mid-layer, right? Shrubs, small trees, bigger wildflowers growing. An another layer of vegetation in the mid-zone. And then let's go up to the canopy. Most of our lakes up here have a forested environment. So that layers of vegetation along the shore, the canopy, the mid-layer, the ground layer doing their thing, that vegetative buffer. Food and cover, but probably most importantly, slowing water down from a rainfall or water coming over the land, spreading that flow out, allowing it to infiltrate back into the ground. So that's what an intact, pretty healthy, lakeshore edge or shoreland edge would be looking like. We have a diversity of life that's utilizing that shoreland area, right? But there's one other critter we got to talk about here, folks. That critter is us. And so one of the things that's happened on our shorelines is a change. Well, let's talk about that change. So beginning in the 1940s and really continuing today, but a lot of this went on from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we changed those three season cabins to four season structures. But let's just back up and think about that three season cabin. Well, the impact of the lake was pretty small when it came to those three season cabins. Where it'd be one ton of sediment to the lake and two pounds of phosphorus coming off that three season cabin lot. And phosphorus is important because that's the driver for these algal problems that we've been experiencing in parts of the state. Well, let's fast forward to that four season house where we start to move from a maybe 800 square foot three season cabin to something like a 4,000, 5,000 square foot second home with hard roofs and an outbuilding maybe of a drive and a driveway that's blacktop. In fact, if we develop that whole 200 foot by 100 foot lot, we can get as much as 18 tons of sediment coming to the lake from that one lot. So that's 18 times as much as the, the uh, three season cabin and 36 pounds of phosphorus from that one lot if we clear the whole thing. Now, that might not seem like much if it's just one lot on the lake, but what's happened is now we allow 52 homes per linear mile along our, our lakes and rivers, right? And so 52 homes times those numbers, you can see why all of a sudden we have a jump in nutrients getting to the lake. The number one stressor in the recent EPA National Lake Assessments, both in 2007 and repeated again in 2012, is the loss of lakeshore habitat. That, those three layers of vegetation we talked about have been, have been impacted, literally taken off the landscape. And the impact is that nutrient and sediment getting to the lake. And so what we're trying to do is get folks to re take a new look at their lot. And maybe think about ways they can either restore some of that native vegetation back to their property, and deal with that stormwater challenge. We've gone through three approaches to doing lakeshore restoration. The first approach is, we call it protection. You have an intact lakeshore system, 
And basically, your job is maintain it. Another approach, no mow. Literally, just put that lawnmower away and see what's in that native seed bank. Oftentimes, there's enough native seeds still in that lakeshore area that the plants will return if we put the lawnmower away. But a lot of cases, what we do is the third approach, accelerated recovery, where we're putting a jump start to the system by returning native plants to that, to that setting. And really, a lot of times, the most important person is either that waterfront property owner or that local lake champion who's helping coordinate things, helping you connect to the grant, helping you connect to the technical information you need to do a good job with your project. So to wrap up, intact, healthy shoreland systems support clean water and wildlife. But they also support our local economies, our local tax bases in lake-rich areas like here in Vilas and Oneida County, where as much as 50 to 90 percent of uh, a local town's tax base is coming from waterfront properties. Pretty important to the fabric of life here in northern Wisconsin. In fact, I would argue that water is life here in northern Wisconsin. So maybe I can start our question and answer period with a couple questions for you. Can you, get, uh, can you get by with a little less lawn on your property? Can you plant some native plants to help support clean water and wildlife? Or if a tree falls along your shore, maybe you can just let it be. What native plants do you recommend for that first layer of shoreline plantings? Yeah, so it really depends on your soil. Uh, we talked about fluctuating water levels before. And one of the biggest challenges in th this part of the world is we can move from the wet-footed situation right at that water's edge to dry sugar sand scenario within a few feet. And so right where that transition zone is, that's where I recommend those plants that can take that wet foot and that dry foot situation some of our sedges, that fireweed I mentioned, and so on. Uh, and then, but you can look at those plant lists on, on the Healthy Lakes website. There's 150 plants listed in those six plans that can get you through. You can send me an email. One of the papers out there I have, we call them workhorse species. These are the species that have these root structures. They also have growth forms that, that support wildlife and so on. I was always under the assumption that if you had grass, that it would hold the water, you know, the, from going, all the stuff from going down into the lake. Is it the grass or is it the stuff that people put on the grass? So if, if they're putting nutrients on the grass, like the gentleman's previous comment, uh, that could be an issue. It could just be washing off to the lake. We don't see as much of that anymore. The problem with grass is that root structure. If it gets four, six inches down into the soil, that's about as, that's a healthy turf grass. And so you don't have those deep penetrating plants. These native plants can get two, three, sometimes 10 feet into the ground with these root structures. And about, oh, a third of those root structures are gonna die back every year, creating these little channels for that water to infiltrate back into the ground. Where a sod sometimes can become so hard and compacted from foot traffic, it actually acts like concrete. There's not much uh, absorption quality to that grass. And so if we walk on it a lot, like we do with our shoreland areas, it can become so, um, so like concrete such that it can't absorb water in an effective kind of way. And as we talked about, we just don't grow very lush lawns up here in northern Wisconsin, right? It's scraggly, it doesn't really have much to it, and so it's not even getting the function that a, a healthy grass could for absorbing a little water and, and even absorbing some of that nutrient runoff. So that's the challenge with grass. Whereas these native plants, they have deep root structures and other benefits to wildlife. 